So this is how in brief a patient has come inside and patient has gone outside. Now in the current situation, now let me suggest we had actually a big discussion yesterday. Uh, a coverall is what is actually recommended as per the mandatory requirements for a aerosol generating procedure. We did have a lot of discussion yesterday about the practicalities in wearing a coverall, how difficult it is to first of all to get into it and the second thing to remain or uh, to work in it with comfort, difficult. Third thing to remain alive for a period of time, difficulty. Fourth one to come out of it, difficult. It's all a bundle of uh, coverall uh, um, um, difficulties in managing a patient or wearing. So practically that was not found to be very feasible. So we had actually discussed and uh, thought of some practical solution which can be adopted by our practitioners. And these are our suggestions. Now this is coming to that. Now if you wear a regular head cap, okay, Red cap, the regular head cap you can get for uh, five rupees. The regular head cap you can get for uh, five rupees. And eye protection, this is just a cost split up also. I've incorporated into that what is actually regularly required. So, uh, without risking much of the protection, the regular requirements is as follows as per the cost of the minimum cost I'm talking about. You can go to any uh, ranges, but this is the average minimum. Eye protection, simple goggles can give you a 65, get from 65 to 75. We can go to Ray Bands, depends upon whatever your brand is, but the basic minimum is 65 rupees, N95 or surgical mask N95 you can get for 100 rupees the person whom we contacted yesterday is supplying all over the country and even globally N95 mask at the rate of 100 and that's an extremely very good product face shield again is a mandatory requirement I want all of you to make the use of face shield as a habitual part of your practice from here onwards even if it's a consultation or every time wear the face shield as, as I mean only if the time when you want to drink something remove that otherwise let that be on your head let that remind you of your protection and things like that that actually uh, you know transpire your your assistance to make serious and take a serious note of your things what you're insisting for them to do then face shield you can get for 60 rupees onwards you can get to 400 to 700 what Whatever it is. Then a dress I would suggest uh, is an ultra short sleeve dress. When I meant about ultra short sleeve dress is like this, something like this. I'll tell you the reasons why. Now I'll tell you that how the dangers in this and the plus and the minus also. Now if you wear an ultra short sleeve like this, you can actually, you know, tuck your sleeve, the exposed part inside. Just roll it inside, okay, not outwards roll it inside so that the final whatever amount of your say one or two inches of the dress material is turned inside okay is turned inside and then the remaining part of your exposed area whatever it's there is very much amenable for your regular hygiene measures because the the, the chances of contamination is there in this exposed area 100 percent there's no doubt in that but from the contact your contaminated area the virus or anywhere reaches to thing only through your either touch or mold or anything like that so immediately after the procedure if you can take adequate measures to actually you know nicely hand hygiene and sanitize till the exposed area then that would be a good suggestion but again we will actually discuss on that later this is something what i thought uh, is practical and because if you wear a long sleeve and then with the sleeveless gown on it doesn't make any sense because it's difficult for the virus to be removed from the exposed sleeves and the cotton fabric otherwise you should be wearing the regular full sleeve gown and the option is regular wear the full sleeve gown and wear this sleeveless on top on that way also is possible so this i am not this is the thing what i've thought about just worked about the cost of that and the simple plastic apron so this plastic apron can be on top of the regular gown okay what i talked about the regular gown is what i was wearing in my now doing a procedure a full sleeve gown extending till the cloud end okay and it's not a cover on it's a regular gown okay of a 50 gsm made of sms material you can get it for 100 rupees sterile one you get 100 rupees i'm using that okay and the plastic apron i told you on top of that so that i cover the front area so that it doesn't get soiled too much Gloves, you can either have a sterile or an examination, non-sterile one, depending upon the procedure, what you're doing. If it's a surgical, go for surgical gloves. If it's an examination, go for either nitrile or a lattice gloves. A nitrile glove is a little costly. That's why I put the range of six rupees or eight rupees. Lattice will be still costlier, still, still cheaper. Then a regular footwear or the footwear, your footwear shoe, that regular coverall will have an attached uh, shoe cover. You can, act, you can wear that. Patient gloves. This is something which I've only mentioned about the cheaper bakery wala variety, PVC gloves, that loose fitting wala thing. If you're giving in the reception, head cap again. Beaded in mouth rinse. Because this is the cost, what I worked out is for the other area, is four rupees for a patient. Now, beaded in mouth rinse, if you notice, is coming as a, a 200 ml bottle. 
okay 200 ml bottle so it's coming as a 100 ml bottle the cost of that is 210 rupees so per ml it will cost you about say 100 uh, 2 rupees per ml um, um, sorry 1 rupee uh, per 100 plus 100 to 1 yeah it's costing about one rupee ten by per ml if you think about the cost effectiveness a two ml of betadine is actually to be diluted with equal amounts of water or more to get the desired uh, concentration of what is recommended as 0 0.02 uh, sorry 0 0.2 so uh, your five to seven ml of your betadine solution available at the rate of four rupees a patient gown i have put stars because by anandas so that patient gown can be again one of the 20 or 25 rupees the cheap gown you can wear and disinfect after every use you are after the ingredient procedures, the sanitizer and the disinfector and the floor cleaner areas that all together that share per patient while I use I'm talking about about 30. Overall, if you see 150 to 200 per patient, if you are able to charge extra in the current scenario as accounting towards the special treatment protocol charges, there are two things advantage with that that will definitely take care of your cost because many of these things are reusable, mind you. So I have not actually taken the full cost as the per patient cost. Many of these things are reusable. So if you take a proportionate share of that, an average 150 to 200 rupees if you charge one patient along with the consulting. So that is where the importance is because when you consult a patient, well, when the patient calls for an appointment, we should actually tell about the, uh, the, the way how we are practicing the current scenario, about the wearing the mask and coming, about restricted number of bystanders, about coming on time and things like that. And along with that, if treatment is required, these are the additional things what is required for your safety and for our safety. So uh, amount of 200 rupees would be extra to get the kit, which is actually costing you 700 bucks, but then we are actually giving you for the rate of 200 for because partly we are also bearing. So 150 to 200 rupees for a procedure in which the way how we are doing, then then there, change itself is obvious for the patient because we never had these sort of uh, sort of you know or gmx all these things when the patient was same patient was treated earlier so when you do that now patient will definitely feel the difference so 150 200 for all things what you wear patients are not going to think whether is this going to be reused or not for that particular person or the patient then the confidence what you can give is something really great so 150 200 rupees is actually my recommendation from uh, to you all so that any if at all your extra requirement would be in terms of procuring these gowns the head caps and things like that nothing more than the older ones actually not hardly anything is there so that extra requirement can be actually retrievable by taking 200 rupees or 150 the patient and in fact a little bit of savings also comes on that and patient will definitely appreciate i'm sure in the current scenario patient safety is more is what they are concerned about unless they have suicidal tendencies otherwise they are actually scared and worried about their health and their lives they will do anything for that so 150 to 200 rupees per patient will definitely work out if you can just actually go through this uh, formula things like that this is something what i felt the admins also can add on to it later if anything in terms of cost effectiveness well now i told you the area side now there's a danger area now this is the now if you are not wearing the 100 rupees while a gown inside i'm not talking about the operator i'm talking about the assistant if your assistant is not wearing the sorry if your assistant is not wearing the 100 rupees while a gown inside this plastic gown will definitely take care of those areas except this and this the neck area and this okay so these two are the vulnerable areas which is actually exposed so that's what i'm telling you you can either make the assistant also wear 100 rupee extra if you pair that can be worn okay these things i'll tell you this can be reused because now this particular once it's reused the chances of barrier property is lost that's something what you have to understand but barrier property is in two means one is about the penetration of the virus Okay, the second one is the fluid penetration. Now, if you disinfect it adequately, this can be reused. If when you, when you are reusing the gowns, anything of that so advantages, you can actually having an overall cover of the gowns, even though bacterial penetration and the virus penetration is not there. So in such a typical case, even if you use this regular disposable plastic water thing for every patient after disinfection is good enough. So that's what we were thinking yesterday to suggest. So if you want, if you want to take care of this red sun also, go for a full sleeve gown and uh, that regular full sleeve gown, what I talked to you about uh, 100 rupees and again, go for a plastic gown on top of that. Otherwise, leave this area open so that that area can be nicely sanitized after your regular hand wash because soap kills like anything. So after this thing, pray proper hand wash and all these areas, which is only exposed area now, can be taken care. So either of these two can be opted for. 
now this is something uh, now I, I i'm sure that i have got attention of everyone by putting this um, beautiful picture out here now i want much more attention to much more serious thing that is the t zone now that i've got your attention out here please focus on the t zone i know things are open beyond the t zone also there but then please focus on the t zone which is very much important we have to emphasize we have to play our role to make sure the t zone is actually safeguarded do not touch unnecessarily all these areas but the importance of t zone as we explained to your staff also so t zone always can be helped by many means one is prevent hiding if you wear the mask continuously if you wear the uh, gloves continuously that's why i insisted upon wearing the uh, gloves and your regular mask for the staff because they are not much aware they won't actually have the uh, the tendency to go and test that's why i told them to wear continuously and then frequent hands uh, sanitizing and sterilizing or oh, sorry disinfecting or the sanitizing would be of great help then three ply mask and examination was continuously to wear is also a good idea for the fact for the staff especially because we are more aware and we can take care and avoid touching men when I, I when I'm, I didn't, I didn't mean, don't take me wrong, it's not mine, it's basically the mouth, ears, and the nose area. Okay, so our touching this area, which is, and again, a part of the T zone also. So, T zone should be protected and very much careful. Now, what are the procedures to be done in between? Now, your assistant, as part of disinfecting in between procedure, should be wearing a utility glove, compulsory and mandatory. Regular gloves is not at all good enough. Your regular lattice glove is totally uh, very vulnerable to the chemicals and things like that. So, do not use that. Lattice gloves has got a more stability again, uh, your uh, um, what you call chemicals and other things. But then that doesn't extend further upwards. So, always make sure your cleaning staff wear the uh, utility gloves and uh, the, she, or she or he should be transferring the instruments wearing that. After each case, dispose all the disposables, including the disposable suction tape. Then disinfect the suction lane. This I'm talking about the sequence of order of working. See, disinfect the suction lane. Now, how to disinfect suction lane? Also, I'll tell you later. Disinfect all the chair parts, all the chairs, that is the leading part, the sitting part, the lights, and the fittings, and things like that. Then after that, go for the disinfection of the doctor's tool. Then the, the, the disinfect the floor and the premises. So that's basically, and then any reusable ones like the gowns, what I told you earlier, that has to be put in a disinfection and things like that. So these are the things, the procedures, what should be done between uh, as a, after every procedure is done for before it gets ready for the next patient. Now, as far as where to clean, how to clean, now this is the dental chair, what we are working up with. And this is what I call the danger zone. Now, a six to 10 feet of a range radius from the center with the chair as a center is considered to be a danger zone. Why is it called danger zone? Because the chances of the spread of aerosol. Now aerosol are particles of the range of 0.3 to 0.5 microns. 0.5 microns onwards as the particle size of the aerosol increase, we call them as droplets. So anywhere more than 10 microns is considered as a proper droplet spread or high or larger size of aerosols. Now aerosols are lighter when compared to the droplets. Two types of, you know, splashes can occur from the patient's mouth. One is aerosol, the other one is your splash. Two things has to be taken care. That's where the distance is measured and kept. Now, when you're talking about a splash or a splatter or a droplet, the size of that is about 10 microns. The size of that is much more than the regular aerosol. So that did not travel for a longer distance. So that actually travels to a maximum of one, 1 1.5 meter and settles in that area. So that is the what the study says, because the droplets, if you're worried about that, your one to 1 1.5 meter around should be the potential risk area as far as droplets are concerned. We are concerned more about the aerosol. Aerosol are light the ones which are of lighter particle size and they tend to remain in the air for a longer period of time they remain suspected in the air for a longer period of time and they tend to sediment or settle on floor surfaces within a period of 30 minutes if it is not being circulated and carried across by your uh, your ceiling fan and things like that so whenever you work on a patient do not put the ceiling fan as i told you earlier in my classes about the air part i'm not going to repeat here make sure if you your, your clinic is actually ventilated. Now, if you want to put the AC on, make sure you have done the cooling part before the patient enters and leave the AC on for some time earlier. And when the, if you're doing a procedure for that particular point of time at the point of aerosol generating five or six or 10 minutes and the time required for this to settle about 30 minutes. Now, aerosol generator takes 30 minutes to settle minimum. 
if it's not thrown away or dragged away. So that particular period plus your working time time, so 30 to 40 minutes of your time, if your room is adequately ventilated, if you are, don't have put the fan on to drag this thing like that, you can take care of this aerosol along with your high vacuum suction and other suction devices with extra or whatever it is, we can think about that later. So six to 10 feet is an average or a safe distance uh, of cleaning or which you should consider as danger zone around your clinic to take care of the settled aerosol and the droplets. And don't, I'm repeating once again, this 10 feet measurement is based on the assumption that your aerosol is not being dragged away by a act of negligence from your side by putting the ceiling fan or you're sort of putting a lack of ventilation while a thing or whatever other methods. So this is a safety method and this is a safety distance. Now, if you start cleaning, okay, in what direction is something what I'm talking about. If your assistant starts from the leg end, okay, now from top to bottom. Now, the first part I told you is all over. The first part, I told you the, from, the, from the chair as such, you start from the, the assistant wearing the utility gloves, using a regular disinfectant spray or the alcohol wipes or whatever it is as recommended as the disinfectant. It could be a watery ammonium compound, it could be alcohol based, it could be any of those chlorine compounds, whatever it is, but then depending upon the area you're contacting, depending upon the chances of getting corroded, depending upon the electronic parts you have to change, whichever it is. So whatever it is, is your disinfectant, you start from the top, right from the light on the handle, the light arm, okay, then you come downwards okay the spittoon has to be nicely brushed and then disinfect everywhere patient you're wearing the staff is wearing your duty gloves then the chair area and then all those areas then comes the floor area okay i'll tell you what how to do the chair but then this is now remember you are doing the floor area so floor area also it should be always uh, done from inside to outside now uh, let me tell uh, sorry the outside inside whatever it is uh, let me, you can you can see the stroke how it is Okay, now if you have a long mop or whatever, you can actually use a regular mop to mop in this direction. Okay, and then like this, like this. So that part is over. Then you come to the leg end. Okay, and then the head end this side, and then the other, that head end again is clear. And then this side, this side, this side. So this is basically an idea uh, of this thing. Then uh, this can be the other way around also, inside, outside, outside, inside. Again, Dr. Anand was suggesting a better plan for this in uh, uh, talking about training from outside to inside. So again, whatever way it is, then make sure the, a the area is not contaminated. So make sure you don't step into an area which you have already cleaned. Okay, that way, so you make sure the chair should be the first thing which is clean and should be from top to down onwards for the chair fittings and then the floor. Floor should be ideally, what Dan was suggesting is, I feel there's a point in that, you can from the periphery to inside. Basically, you should not contaminate an area which you have already disinfected by means of your uh, one person bleach which you are using on the floor or other disinfecting agents okay that's how you do a cleaning and this again i've already mentioned one meter is a standard distance when you talk about a droplet spread two meters something what you should assess when you're talking about aerosol hand washes different 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 hand washes for the use for the operator in between you can you can choose any of those type alcohol base is there but preferably it's advisable not to use any chlorex based hand washes because the regular isopropyl alcohol or propanol content alcohol, your hand drop would be the hand the, of choice and this is the chair now how to disinfect i was telling you if your uh, if your particular thing is standing there and now if you're using a regular uh, disinfectant with the spray attached or if you're using a regular, you may, you may be having the regular isopropyl alcohol, which is come in bottles. You get to buy this five rupee, 10 rupee plunger. Okay, you can fit into that lid. Okay, you can use uh, alcohol as a mist also. Whichever way, if whichever disinfectant you are using, if you're using the mist or the spray type, you should hold it at a distance of one feet. Okay, it should only one feet from the chair. Now, why I said one feet from the chair is, now, if you spread it too far from the chair, the, the, with the mist what you're creating tends to get scattered either here and there and because of the, uh, the, uh, the pressure and the variation, the air can get dissipated here and there. If you get too close, lesser than one feet, your area of deposit insulation will be too small a radius. So one feet at distance is good enough to give an adequate radius to cover adequate areas of the chair. So one feet from the dental chair surface with the plunger on, if you start from the head end like this, one, the first circle will come, second, third, each of the circles should be, because you can see the visible amount of wetness on the chair when you're spraying. So see that directly, visualize it with your assistant on the utility gloves on and the mask on, okay? And like this, so you can actually overlap the thing. So in less than, in less than a minute, actually you can finish the entire 
chair training area. Then, of course, similarly, you can go for the spit tool area and your uh, uh, doctor's tool and other disinfectant and other swipe. We can use little alcohol swipes uh, for the other chair areas. Okay, suction part will come to later. This is what I was talking about the distance from the spray to the unit. And another one very important, what I would like to stress upon is based, sorry. Before you clean the chair, make sure you lift the chair completely and make it flat and supine because you might have worked in a semi reclined position. The junction between the leaning part and the seating part is never going to get disinfected with the disinfected spray. So the moment the thing is over, you lift the patient chair and make it flat so that the entire surface is available for the disinfectant surface to reach. So raise it flat and moreover, when you raise it, the underneath areas of the chair is also visible for the spray to reach. So that's the advantage of raising the chair high and keeping the distance. Suppose some people are comfortable not with the spray if you can use a regular mop with disinfect with the dipped with alcohol or whatever it is you can use that no problem whatever method of disinfection make sure the entire surface is actually disinfected make sure the patient is the, the your staff is wearing your utility gloves that's the main thing now as far as agents are concerned Okay, the various agents you can either choose from alcohol preparations, you can choose from clothes, except for the second one, aldehyde category, you can go for chlorine compound with the inherent risk of uh, your corrosion problem. Then you can also go in for uh, oxidizing and hydrogen peroxide also. And these are hydrogen peroxide and chlorine compound, they do have this tendency for, uh, you know, um, metal components to get corroded. And so basically, I try to avoid that in areas where you have electronic components and things like that. Then phenolic compounds, again, a good choice, and pottery amine compounds, a very good choice for disinfectant so any of these disinfectants commercial available plenty in the market you can use the technique i told you how to use from where to from top to bottom your staff should be happily properly uh, wearing a utility gloves and this is what i was talking about uh, that with the regular this is what i use in my clinic the regular uh, surgical spirit isopropyl alcohol i just this plunger i bought it for 20 rupees in from the local market here i just fitted into it and that's what my the staff is utilizing for that you can have a, a commercial products from uh, the various surface disinfectants are that you can use that this is from a septoidin called a surface again another one from called torcolosid plenty of them they can use the regular spray is there swipe is there different type i'm not going the details of that you can you scroll in the net you can uh, whatever material of choice without compromising on the concentration you can use for chair disinfection okay the simple method again again something but if you have a small container okay you can kind of put them your isopropyl alcohol you can pour in that and a simple one your regular scotch bright your regular scotch bright i'm sure all of you might be uh, very familiar with the scotch bright especially guys in this scenario will be very familiar after the period of lockdown they started peeping into the kitchen and uh, wives have started started uh, nicely enjoying uh, getting the help of the aspects and clearing the um, stuff and now scotch bread will be a very common and familiar and uh, scary entity for all those guys i remember i know that but then the scotch bread with the hard thing on top and the underneath you can put in this uh, what you call this thing so basically if you see this container this is alcohol okay you have dipped in so your your container is always filled with alcohol and then your sponge is inside that and the outer surface is actually less permeable and it's always kept close it's a simple soft dish with a in with without perforations so or you can have a simple plastic you know small plastic container in that and you can just close it and give advantages you always have a ready-made amount of alcohol impregnated soap solution or your your agent to actually rub on the wherever chair on the parts like i showed you if you're not using a spray if you want to use a mop you can have because mop again has to be discarded somewhere or washed and wet now this advantage will remain close in that and actually you can actually nicely wipe wipe I mean, and the surface also will be always disinfected because it's actually dipped in spirit so there's no harm in leaving there because you can pour some spirit on top also it'll also always remain a sterile piece or disinfected piece for you to work upon with so that is something simple one you can use in your clinic if you are required if you feel high maybe you want to buy something else no problem okay and the, as far as the disinfection is concerned every part of your chair has to be disinfected the uh, utility gloves as we want this a nitrile gloves the picture which i got from there so wearing the utility gloves the staff has to clean all surfaces either the the or that way and this is what i was talking about the chair has to be lifted up so that the entire surface is very much obvious and we can you know use the disinfectant sprays to clean that side this is again i talked to you about the distance minimum distance to be kept okay and uh, some people have the uh, use this barriers 
uh, in between patients okay if then the handpiece they have barriers for the entire table uh, settings you can have a gate ready made barriers for the three way syringes you can even have a disposable um, syringe tips of the three way syringe also you can actually put this uh, pvc uh, lining for the chair and actually disinfect the lining only after each time you need not actually remove the lining in between if at all every time that way also we can use it we can use barriers to put on the uh, your uh, light handle if you're using an x ray i told you it's not recommended for iop regular but rbg is okay with the regular precautions as i have suggested so basically you can utilize this bag this is basically or this slide is fully about the use of barriers and that for those people who have the problem with the barriers is again you're going to add to the existing law existing you know like uh, the, the existing collection of your other uh, drapes and all disposable and the discarded materials the amount of biomedical waste which is going to get accumulated in your clinic is going to be more if you use this type and another one thing if you put this plastic on touch chair and then when the patient you make the patient sit it's very difficult for the patient to be comfortable because patient is going to slide all through so basically very difficult for the patient to sit through also so if it's always advisable to uh, disinfect the the chair with the disinfectants and some uh, clinics or some chairs where they do have this fabrics uh, as a uh, on top of it attachment definitely these type of barriers would be a good option and that can be disinfected after every use need not actually remove every time well as far as uh, your suction apparatus i told you that is very important because every time you use a suction and then the suction dip you can discard but the entire suction apparatus the tubings and the, which is going into the suction uh, bottle is going to be a paka source of all the microbes so you need to disinfect the suction apparatus how to do that how i will show you this is basically a commercial preparation available from septoden it's called aseptol a or you can use your regular uh, prepare this again a, a costly product from it's called md 555 it's coming from dur dental okay this is again uh, the, the what they do is basically uh, they, this is coming with a ready made uh, uh, dispenser and of course under another one bottle of concentrate solution so what they do they have this this, this is a, the right side image what you see is the dispenser one in which they uh, put the concentrate and make about uh, you know 2 liters of water and then they use that 2 liters of water to use the suction tubing to suck it okay and make the motor work and suck the entire thing and then that remains a particular period of time the entire suction tubing and the apparatus get disinfected this is basically all these three are a bit costly for you in terms of so those who want to go in for a more quality or more costly products can go in for this uh, uh, gadget so can go in for this type of uh, disinfectants but what i use in my practice is simple uh, a bleaching solution a 1% uh, sodium hypochlorite solution is something what i use okay this is basically available as So uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to the next slide. This is about the regular bleaching powder. What the domestic bleaching powder is available as a five to six percent uh, uh, powder. The bleaching powder I told you earlier, it's comprising of calcium chloride, whereas your, um, your regular calcium chloride and the regular bleach, the liquid bleach, the uh, aqueous solution of sodium hypochlorite. So basically, the bleaching powder is available as five to six percent. What you need is basically one percent of a one percent solution to be fabricated to taken up. So one teaspoon is actually comprising of five grams. Okay. So if you take two teaspoons, if you take two teaspoons and mix it with one liter. it becomes a 1% solution so 2 teaspoons of your regular household bleaching powder you mix it with your regular board 1 liter board of this lady or your uh, anything whatever you would like to choose any 1 bullet a bottle or if you 2 liter also no problem but 2 liter means you have to add more because 10 grams per liter will give you 1% solution just remember that 10 grams per liter will give you 1 One percent solution. That is the concentration of sodium hypochlorite. What we require in our practice. And one teaspoon is five grams. So two teaspoons will definitely give you that volume. And what I do in my clinic, from because I use a portable suction. I have this bottle uh, thing which is connected to the suction apparatus as a separate unit. And every day morning, my assistant, you know, fills the bottom part with about say 40 ml of your regular. Uh, I prepare this, you know, two liter, one liter bottle. I prepare two three of them. and i use a little bit of that solution i put in this uh, suction bottle morning itself and i close it and then i keep it in the container there okay i'll tell you how i keep it that so it's actually kept close and then the suction after every patient after every use the suction is you know used by this bleaching other another bleaching solution and then that thing is set and then the sucked contents fall into this bottle which is already have already having you know a collection of uh, somebody's somebody's mic is on somebody i can hear that right? cute kid talking dr yeah. lemnan it's your mic yeah 
Okay, now, so this particular, your regular one person bleed can be kept in this. Advantage of this, when the lid is closed with your washer on top, you're having a confined air column, which is actually abundance of chlorine gas inside. So whatever suction and whatever your aspirate is coming into this bottle is getting treated with the amount of chlorine gas and the content there. So at the end of the day, if you remove also no problem because the entire uh, aspirated contents is actually disinfected with the presence of your one person bleach. The efficiency of the bleach doesn't come down because it is actually kept in a closed container and there is no chance of the chlorine vapors to escape so and your suction tubings has to be disinfected after every patient like i told you earlier you can go in for a higher variance of any of those agents or if you want to reduce the course you can use one person uh, bleach solution to come descended and if you have done a surgical procedure the best thing to do is first you can actually use the hydrogen peroxide okay use my nicely circuit so that organic debris gets you know effervescent and can get this debrided off then if you can you can use a sodium hypochlorite also there's no harm in using that otherwise a regular one person so they have solution and you know take two cups i mean regular 120 ml of cups you know you can 120 ml of that you can pour it and put that and use the suction to uh, you know suck it up okay and just pour the chlorine pour the chlorine and keep you can use the cup for the next patient also the not for the patient for sucking the next case because you're pouring it with the chlorine which is again sort of contaminated is contaminating the cup what you're using or you can dispose the cup and take another cup to be on the safer side now a bit about the mopping portion. I told you the floor mopping. It's advisable not to use these type of mops because of the the the, the type of uh, you know the the, the non-supervised work this uh, floor assistants are doing. They do not know a seriousness. They tend to actually you know, you know splash it around and do not flood that area with lot of your detergent solution or lot of your bleach. You know the bleach should be actually just confined to the mop, which is not of this category or this sort of red category because that tend to splash that area or the 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 contents which is actually settled might get you know carried away distant area, so spreading the area of your dangerous zone. So always try to use some mops which is actually very much confined. I'll show you two pictures which can be advised. Never ever try to use uh, any barehanded uh, uh, way method of you know cleaning any debris. Sometimes there might be spilling of blood on the floor. Never try to use a bare hand. It should be always glove and that glove should be always a utility glove also this is a carpet showing some stains you can either saw this is the, i'm talking about the regular tile wala thing but make sure the concept what you want to clear is utility gloves must for the staff who is cleaning the floor plus a mask because the splatter or anything that that splatter can fall on the face that also should be can there's a, no chance of aerosol creating there but then the splatter can actually fall directly on the t-zone of the person who's mopping or wiping and again, I told you again the use of utility masks, wherever utility gloves, wherever we're using. And this is a type of uh, uh, which I found with the net, and I thought which is not going to cause you much of a thing. Now, if you have a container like this, the second middle one, voila. So in that you collect this. Uh, you're coming with your uh, so they have solution and covering and keeping. So when you come inside, that will actually remain as a reservoir. You can use that. You squeeze it two three times there so that there is not too much of sodium hypochlorite solution dripping and spreading the contents on the floor to distant sites. So just adequate enough to get that nice clean contact. So you can use any of these two mops, but I won't prefer the first two pictures. Don't do that. And this is a suction unit which I was telling you about every day morning. My assistant actually fills that bottle, that bottom part with one person bleach, and then it is kept close with a lid there. Okay, bottom, and then this is a small portable unit which actually is kept close to my dental chair under the wash basin in the sealed container. There, it is working on a simple fridge motor, fridge uh, that compressor which hardly makes any sound. Half HP compressor, it doesn't make any sound at all, and it gives a very good suction effect also for my surgical works. I use. I've been using it for the last 20 years or so. This type of portable suctions. So advantages, whatever suction uh, the sucker pad is getting totally disin disinfected with the bleach here, and this actually is working on my foot control it's not automatically i can either use because i don't have to touch the switch in between because it's going to each and every time contaminate it so i've actually connected with the foot control so that's at my this is the foot control we have been taking all my kicks and uh, you know stamming for the past 10 15 20 years so this is the foot control whenever i press this this air rotor and the thing and this is my scalar control so, so this is my thing so whenever i press the suction works Okay, the suction kind of important part. One thing what you should realize is the moment uh, if you don't disinfect the suction properly for the next patient, when you put the suction tip on the suction tube and then put in the patient's mouth, and then when the patient, the immediate instinct of the patient is to close the mouth by by automatically the patient closes. Now, when the patient closes the mouth, there is a vacuum automatically created in the mouth. 
So, and your suction dip inside with the vacuum inside is going to create a negative pressure inside, which is going to suck. And with that is the most common cause for the reverse flow of the contents, which is remaining in the suction tube. That is why it is very important to make sure that you at least two cups of your disinfectant solution has to be sucked in this area. So the area is disinfected, the suction tube is disinfected. So this is something what you should keep in mind. Whenever you put the patient, the, the suction in the patient's mouth, it's advisable not to keep the mouth open the patient because in the moment you open the mouth again the negative pressure can suck the contents from the tubings not from the mortar i'm just sorry one advice regarding use of mobile phone call because after the lockdown otherwise also we have been so much you know fond and passion and we have fallen in love with that small device with all sort of uh, you know applications installed and loaded into that we can't survive without that whether now going back to work again change of habit is always difficult to come now you will be tended to look for notifications the whatsapp the chats all those things like that will be coming so temptation so naturally so you tend to take the phone again that's a big danger let me tell you because phone is something just going to be with you all the time and that's something which you always take keeping contact going back home to your loved ones again with that contaminated stuff it's a big danger let me tell you if you are using phone you can use it but with a certain uh, precautions now this i'm talking about your telephone your mobile phone is very much dangerous and should be used with caution you get this simple small polythene sealed plastic bags it hardly costs you any two rupees or less than that okay you buy your 10 or 20 and keep in your clinic okay advantage is that the, the day one when you come inside the moment you enter the clinic you just put your mobile in that cover you seal the cover okay so it's basically that that sealed cover can be any time disinfected or thrown or whatever it is so it's readily available for your use also if at all you want to use but then i would never recommend using mobile phones while working on patients so never ever do that especially in this covid era time never do that because that's again let, let us focus on the protocols and the safety measures what we are actually planning to do now so do not attempt to any calls unless you have a bluetooth headset a bluetooth headset which is of a short size which is occupying within the face of the pinna is recommendable now why i'm telling you because that gets covered within the head cap the head cap what you put if you can overlap the bluetooth headset definitely that bluetooth is also covered from and protected from your the regular aerosol and other wares okay and if you can set your mobile phone if you are so passionate about answering the calls in between the cases then you can actually set your mobile phone to automatic answering after two or three weeks your bluetooth will get automatically on without pressing any switch so you can actually divide i mean activate that mode on or you can ask and once you finish talking maybe you can ask your staff to because this is kept on the counseling table very far from the uh, operating site so your staff can actually put press the switch and put the mobile off never ever try to use this type of um, even though it's a bluetooth but then the cords which is hanging loose could be a source of potential accumulation of debris so do not use that sort of wired headsets always go for bluetooth headsets and this type of pouch is very much recommendable and the end of the day advantages the outside surface can be disinfected open up take the phone and go you can decide, you can either throw the pouch if you are so much worried about the cost of that one rupee or two rupee pouch also you can keep it at the after day five use that so day one day two take the next part day three day out that n95 mask say maybe five days later you can go back to your nostalgic effects and go back to the first pouch if you are so much worried about that one rupee two rupee for the pouch that's about the one maybe bottom which i have to share you regarding the use of mobile phone now just let's have a quick recap about workflow what is to be done in the clinic first thing what i told you telephonic appointments has to be there and then based on the initial screening you have completed in the operatory initial screening do the telephonic appointments itself if you do that's more than enough because whether you can ask the patient the history the sign of any symptoms of covid any travel visits all that can be done so initial screening can be done there in the in the waiting room also initial screening is done okay then documentation of the temperature time vital statistics patient's data other card whatever it can be done in waiting room and then you are making the patient waiting there at the time of waiting itself you are telling the patient what is going to be the operatory procedures the do's and don'ts you're telling the patient there itself okay then what that is done again the patient is taken to the operatory and all the operatory procedures as per i mentioned in the earlier explained really can be done and then in the meantime if there's no patient waiting in the waiting room you can disinfect the waiting area the, the staff in the waiting room can disinfect the waiting area by using any of those disinfectants for the chairs and you can use the regular one person bleach for the floor and other surfaces anywhere area and then otherwise if the next patient is already come patient can be seated in the waiting area okay and then next is basically other patient who's already completed inside there itself you can you are finishing all the instructions and the patients coming out and doing the payment and then sending that patient outside and disinfect and the sending the uh, waiting patient inside the next patient waiting inside and then you can do the 
disinfection. So if you, if they, when the patient's gone inside, if you don't have a patient waiting in the waiting room, you can do the disinfection there. Or else, if there's another patient waiting, when that particular person is gone inside, you can do the disinfection. So this is in brief the workload, the recap from what I have mentioned, told about all this time now. Now with that, uh, now let us go into the uh, what treatments is very much important thing. What all of you are worried about? What is the point in just going for extraction? What is the point just for consulting? What? How am I going to earn my daily bread? Well, very much concerned I know about all of you are, but then just keep in mind. I'll just list uh, treatments what can be done. Well, as per the current protocols, as per the regulatory body's institution, we are bound, but we are supposed to do only emergency treatment procedures. And what falls under that category and what can be uh, included in that category based on that is what I've developed a list of treatments. Again, number one thing, now let me talk about first, so severe dental pain from pulpite, which I already talked about. A person is not responding to antibiotics, and it made it definitely. You can call the patient, open up this thing and go for a root canal in such critical case. With pericoronitis and third molar pain, not responding to the particular medication, in case that particular tooth is required to be removed, that has to be removed. Patient can be called up. Any post extraction complication, a dry sock, or anything of an extraction case, what you have done as an emergency procedure. If the patient is having any abscess, swelling, pain, all this can be taken up. And two, if the patient has fallen or anything accidental, whatever it is, the tooth is fractured and the pain is on tooth is there. If there's a pulpal exposure and the tooth fracture is there, pain is there, you can call and go for a pulpectomy. And then if the patient is the tooth fracture is giving rise to, uh, you know, uh, soft tissue trauma or cheek pad, then you can call the patient and do the rounding off or whatever is that. But rounding off, I'll tell you as much as possible, try not to use an aerotor. Your regular micromotor with a speed of 30,000 can be done in such situations, uh, even for a root canal opening also, if you can do, because earlier days, in my days, we used to work on patients with uh, uh, with, uh, with the air, with the, not with the air motor, with the micro motor on. And uh, the advantage of using micro motor is, is a bit, uh, you know, time consuming because we don't need to be worried about the use of uh, loss of time because we have plenty of time because we are only planning about minimum number of patients in the current scenario. So a use of a micro motor instead of an air rotor, even though it's not having that much of a torque, that much of an efficiency like air rotor, but that can be used. Advantages, the only disadvantage is, you know, the heat generation, but heat generation is also not a problem there because in when we were taught that the, the preventing uh, micromotor from cutting was the heat induced could generate pulpal injury and pulpal necrosis but here a pulp which is already dead we need not be concerned about the thermal insult what is caused by the micromotor but then if we can save if we can prevent aerosol why not try that okay it's a bit difficult time consuming but with the thing you can definitely master that if the tooth is falling, the traumatic avulsion, luxation, any dental alveolar fracture, these are all things which are actually uh, to be considered as far as an emergency. An emergency need not be always a fatal emergency as far as dentist is concerned. An emergency could be in terms of, you know, an acute uh, problem in, uh, you know, mastication or function, uh, an acute problem in terms of up in a person. Suppose uh, this is a traumatic avulsion happened of a front teeth and now that particular person is actually sitting, I mean, running a main store where in which many people come now, now host all players there are so many uh, you know you know leeways given for many type of stores to be kept open now he or she is a person who's actually interacting with many people in the public so basically keeping that even though he has to wear mask he won't be psychologically comfortable so for him a particular tooth loss by a trauma is actually an emergency as far as acid is concerned but that doesn't give you a license to practice fixed for F, uh, fpds or any crown cutting in such patients if any fracture tooth can be said you can actually remove that extract that tooth do us and then uh, so, 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 then you can do a simple impression okay simple impression gave bath you can have to disinfect the impression with this uh, uh dilinol and other solution what i tell you later when when it comes to sterilization and then we can we can nowadays i don't know whether the labs are open also if the lab is not open you can make a self-care acrylic rpd and give a temporary relief for the emergency of the lack or the loss of the aesthetic that's something what can be done i'm not at all recommending crown cutting or bridge cutting don't do that now then the dental treatment prior to critical medical procedures. Now, patients who are so actually posted for bypass surgery and other cardiac complications. Now, you in the present scenario, if they're required, you have to open up clinic and do the treatment for them, the emergency procedures, whatever required, because you can't tell them, please hold on, please die later, because patient, uh, we, we are worried about corona, and they're at the mercy of corona also, and they're at the mercy of uh, the cardiac problem also. So such situation has to be given priority. Any any malignancy looking uh, biopsy tissues, at, if you're on a clinical exam, if you see that can be taken up for biopsy because you are uh, if you are if you feel the waiting can actually make the condition worse for the patient again that's uh, considered to be an emergency well uh, a patient who's wearing a long bridge if suppose a lower left on here he or she has got a long bridge that the person that side is the area where the person was chewing all this time that the bridge is thought he can't eat or chew anything now the patient's coming back 
you have to go for a re-cementing. So I'll, as much as possible, try not to use air water, try to use a regular probe or sickle seal, whatever, and try to displace the cement and then try to fix it. And later, you tell the patient that this might come out later and in case it comes up, you have to fix it again. So that's the way you have to, you can go for a fixing a, a, or re-cementing a display crown and bridge. The next MC caries, I told you, severe caries and then period of patients where is having severe pain, pulpal pain. Uh, in case you have placed a suture that has can patient can be recalled for suture removal. Any uh, danger where a person who's actually depending upon the danger for the own for the functioning of eating and mastication has some uh, main handicaps uh, so connected with the danger, fracture repair, and things like that. Definitely that can be taken up and repaired. Then orthodontic patients undergone, I suppose the wire comes out of your molar tube or you get fractured and things like that, getting sharp and cutting on the cheek. Patient can be recalled and then adjusted. The wires can be adjusted. Any bracket which is from, you know, displaced or a module which is gone or the band which is displaced. These are all going to actually seriously affect the outcome of the dental treatment. So that also is or can be considered as an emergency and uh, that also has to be taken care and acute dislocation again has to be taken care. Now when I talk about these things can be taken care that doesn't give you the license to practice all these without following the standard operatory procedures and the protocols which i mentioned earlier all these procedures if at all you are doing has to be done with all specific precaution which we have mentioned earlier following all the guidelines as per the standard operatory procedures have to take all measures for the uh, air safety protocol and measures to prevent transmission spread that is my message to you all as far as the treatments are concerned now uh, we'll take up any questions or queries if it's required anything like that if you say we can talk up and thank you for a patient listening and uh, uh, thank you all for being with me with so much time spending time and really regret for all the shortcoming which had happened in the earlier uh, uh, time which had actually lost interest in many of you all but then thank you all once again i know it's a big challenging time for each and every one of you for a lot of concerns but let me assure you corona is not going to go corona is going to be with us we have to live with the corona but that doesn't mean that we have to quit from our profession our profession the dentistry is the only one which is actually giving us the bread and butter. You can't just quit that. But definitely we have to work and live with Corona, take measures to get our protection and the staff protection, the family protection from Corona, actually play your part in preventing transmission spread of Corona and increasing the contagious, your uh, so community spread, and then comfortably practice taking all the measures Follow the law of the land. Again, I'm telling you, whatever instruction is following you in that particular scenario, follow that. So within these constraints, I wish you all a uh, constrained, uh, restricted practice, and but then worthwhile in terms of the present situation. Wishing you all the best and waiting for your queries and comments and more add-on chips from that means and uh, ready to answer the queries from the participants. Thank you to you. Mahendra. Uh, Dr. Mashankar, sir. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, very valuable presentation, sir. Point by point, you went in depth, and it was amazing how you have prepared a lot. You have given yeah. a lot of, sir. Thank you so much. These are all personal contents and preparations based on my thoughts and logical applications and practical implementations for you all. But there are hardly any net pictures you would see in that is my own presentation uh, contents and So many of them would be a bit of a conflict as far as the regular standard requirements and uh, recommendations are concerned. So the, I'm not asking you all to deviate from that. Definitely for those who are interested in course, you should be a big dividend. But then my point is you should practice without uh, compromising safety without compromising any uh, spread of contagious disease. That's my sincere request to you. Don't just get tempted with uh, the so-called you know, financial liability. Your emergency, when they talk about doing only emergency procedures, they don't mean the emergency for you in terms of financial need. What the circle, what the government has meant is about the emergency in terms of patient. So definitely, if you can see the list of treatments, what I mentioned earlier, you can cover a lot of your treatments within the confined and following a regular uh, leisurely practice, taking all the adequate precautions. Yeah, please. Who is taking the questions? Admin, can I, uh, who is taking? Can I, can I uh, make a comment? Uh, oh, sir, sir, George Paul, sir, yes. Yeah. Uh, just two things. I mean, uh, first of all, let me congratulate Jai Pent. It was an extremely comprehensive uh, coverage of almost all aspects of practice in dentistry. I think you, I don't think there is anything that you left out. Uh, just a few observations, not very important, but you know, just uh, a matter of concern. One is uh, you asked for everybody to leave their footwear outside and then, uh, I mean, of course, go through the you know, foot carpet and things yeah. like that. Yes. Uh, is it safe for the patient to actually walk around biologically? Because it's a biohazard area right now. So in no biohazard area are you allowed to actually walk around 
without footwear. So would you think that uh, the dentist should supply some amount of footwear? I mean, even in the operation theaters, when we go in, we take our footwear out and they give you a, another set of footwear. So do you think that that might be a... So, so two, two things you asked me, I would like to answer and place my comment on that. The first thing regarding uh, entry of the patient into a biohazard zone. Now the patient, the, the area, the dental clinic and the dental operatory becomes a biohazard zone only after a person or a patient with the positive uh, a carriership or, a, or the chances of thing enters the clinic only from that particular point on. Only if you have a, a lapse in following the protocols of uh, disinfection and sterilization, then it becomes a real biohazard. A potential biohazard, of course, is is there but as far as the floor is concerned definitely that's the most vulnerable area and most easiest area of also to keep it disinfected so there's no question of the foot getting coming in contact with any biohazard if you follow the proper uh, floor cleaning measures and as sir said definitely if you have any provisions of providing the patient with a separate uh, footwear as the patient inside definitely that part can be taken care but the problem is now every patient as the patient goes back this footwear is now you're going to disinfect again mm -hmm. and reuse so if you can find measures for that definitely then that again adds up your work and things like that but then definitely our area is definitely a potential biohazard but the problem by not leaving not wearing a footwear and coming inside and the sole of the feet touching the floor alone is taken care of by proper disinfecting with your one person breathing every routine protocol all the room because that has if you have failed in your floor uh, disinfection area if you're not supervisor monitor or like that then definitely you are yourself contributing to uh, make that area by our side because that is the simplest thing to clean the floor if your monitoring is done properly because with the proper regular mops what's available it's very easy to mop that area overlapping one section by on the with the cheapest one person solution so you can actually convert that area into a non biohazard area with proper this thing by mistake if at all if you feel you have any lapse in your uh, disinfection then you can provide a uh, um, uh, footwear but again that's again adding to cost and, uh, it's disinfecting not, it's, disinfecting. I, I think considering all the other costs that we mentioned, it's not much. If you have a tub filled with uh, water and uh, you know uh, hypochlorite or something like that, uh, they can just put their footwear into that and wear their own footwear and go. See, legally there is an issue if they, if for whatever reason uh, they become infected after coming there, and if one of these things is pointed out that they were actually made to walk around barefoot in a biohazard area, it. It, it might be an issue. We are culturally used to people walking into our clinics without footwear in our homes as well. But, you know, this is an issue. So there, I know that there are some people in some clinics who actually give them a foot shoe, that plastic thing to wear uh, over their foot when they get in. So I think, I don't know, but there is a, a, a legal issue if someone gets infected and, you know, it can be brought up as one of the issues. Uh, the, the, the second thing, I mean, it's just a comment I made. This is a small thing, but, you know, just to remember. Another thing is uh, you mentioned about cleaning from uh, uh, around the chair from uh, centrifugal and centripetal. That is cleaning from the chair to the outside and making sure nobody else steps, uh, which is okay. But if you if you are going to clean from outside to inside, whoever is cleaning, your, cleaning it is actually painting himself into a box because if that person has to walk out, then they have to again walk across the floor, isn't it? So I think uh, cleaning from inside outside is probably more appropriate, in my opinion. Sorry, Ipin, are you there? Did Sir, you hear that? Yeah. yeah, cleaning from outside to inside is recommended in isolation wards. And, okay. uh, uh, yeah, and if, you, if we have a dental chair, which is in the center of the clinic, and that is considered to be uh, more uh, uh, the right way of doing things. Like uh, the vertical wall, then the flat table top, then the floor, and floor from outside to inside is what is recommended in most of the YouTube in, in, presentations. In most medical practices, it is a standard that you clean from inside out, whether it's scrubbing the skin. If I was you're operating on a cancer, you don't op scrub mm. from outside inside. You always scrub mm. from around the cancer out. Yeah. Uh, I think here also the chair is in the middle, yeah. you, you clean from inside out. If you don't do that, you're painting yourself into a corner around the chair. How do you work out? Who is cleaning it? 
I personally agree with Dr. George Purser what the reason and I was of the same, but then Ananda discussed with me and he had some argument. I mean, as for the ICU, the, uh, what do you call the, the ICU and all those aid, as they do that uh, protocol, but I still feel the day what we do, like our typical scrubbing mother from inside outside would be uh, the most logically viable because we are actually moving from a, a you know, clean area to a dirty area. Now, his concern was the peripheries when you mop it, unaudible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're okay. yeah. So the concern was another is was when we go from center to periphery, the peripheral most area, you might actually spread the debris there further more periphery. Because you if you if you decide to about 10 feet of uh, diameter or radius around the chair to be a dead person, and if you want to clean that, the moment the person mops around the peripheral, the tendency to splash that thing on the periphery that's what he was suggesting so can that can be well, personally that can be take care that can be avoided actually uh, there's yeah. one more point i wanted to make i mean this is a general thing uh, it's uh, i think it's very important to have an informed consent i actually made a comprehensive informed consent which is used by many people in india today yes. uh, which involves during the covid times which involves absolving your responsibility of passing on covid to them and their responsibility of passing on COVID to us. It's not, it's not just a statement or a, or a declaration. It has to be in the format of an informed consent. I already have one written. I put it up on a few. Um, a few yes, sir, because, yeah, in that uh, risk assessment form, I didn't show you the, the magnified version of that. So the risk assessment form, which was given in the as I showed in the picture, is giving you all details about the, uh, the questions we asked, I write from travel and things like that, and also a self declaration from the uh, person is actually taken care in the vernacular language, and also a mention about the possibility of the risk of implications if he or she concedes the relevant information is also mentioned in that. So all things are yeah. being actually mentioned in that particular risk assessment. You can hear that yeah. I can yeah. say it is actually made up. Yeah. Uh, even I'd like you to go through mine because it has been actually yes, vetted. That, that, I, I, I saw that. That's an excellent yeah. one. That's excellent. Yeah. I would recommend, definitely yeah. recommend that. Because it's also got a box and in that box you can actually write that if your tooth is broken and you are not in a position to remove it because it involves aerosol or splatter or whatever it is. You, you are perfectly within your rights to leave that broken root there. Uh, suture it, but please do mention it in your case sheet that due to circumstances, we are not able to remove it. So that box actually gives you a leeway to actually mention procedures you are not able to complete as per standard protocols. That includes a, a instrument separation or many of the other things that may take more time and may put anybody at risk or anything like that. Okay. So I think okay. uh, that is something that everybody should follow because you're going to have a lot of litigation after the end, the, the end of the def def Definitely, very true. Because we don't know what all is waiting for us. It's not just a threat of corona. It's going to be a, a real a long list of uh, litigations. I'm very sure it's going to be in the near future. So we're going to be very, very busy, even though not in practice, uh, we will be very, very busy. So again, uh, get yourself, uh, you know, um, and associated with some national firms where they offer you indemnity. As far as idea Kerala State is concerned, we have the idea of hope is that it didn't get of the members professionally in these things also. So that's again one thing as far as the litigation part is concerned. How about you, sir? Just Paul, sir. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's it. Any questions, sir? Who is taking the questions? In chat box room, chat box. Sir. Mahindra Verman? Oh, yeah. Sir, I'm uh, telling the questions. Uh, what has been listed? Uh, uh, Join the questions together like a list. So the first question is like, uh, what is the strength of the bitter and gargle to be used? Even sir? Hello? Sir, Even sir? Hello? Okay. You can answer, uh, Burman, if sir is not there. Okay. Uh, yes, well, some, one of you can answer it, I think. Yeah. Anand, do you want to answer that? Anand? What was the question? 0.2%. Okay. Fine. Huh. Okay. Uh, that's going to be the strength of the beta and gargle. And um, then the uh, next question is going to be um, uh, where we will get the surgical plastic gown. Uh, that's the thing. So I think the contact person, something uh, we will be sharing in the group. Um, do we do we need to change the full sleeve gown and plastic drape uh, for every patient? Uh, if it is, if even if it is was a consultation situation, 
do we need to change the full sleeve gown and plastic drape for every patient that is what uh, for a consultation i think for a, um, a consultation uh, so even sir you are there no for a consultation we need not change so for a consultation you don't even need to wear a pp as per the cdc as well as uh, if you are not going to actually do a procedure into that area you don't even have to wear a pp actually you need to have a visor a, a good a go not a goggle even if you have a visor a good mask that's more than enough if you're going to just talk to somebody and prescribe medicine you don't need to get into all that okay jo jo sir good evening let's uh permal sir can i just ask one question sir yeah yeah please Yeah, George sir. Good evening, sir. I, I actually I am Dr. Subodh from Palakkad. I just yeah. wanted to have a clarification that we'll be wearing a surgical gown, and over that we'll be having a drape. And during an extraction, and mm. after the extraction, uh, of course, we will be changing the plastic drape. And yeah. should we go for a drape change also, or the gown change also after the uh, after the extraction? no after an extraction no. if you are planning to make a gown change that's going to be very tedious and expensive i don't think you really need to but you should have a barrier between you and the patient which is disposable which can be a plastic or whatever it is okay can so the gown be disinfected sir can the gown be disinfected see i think it depends on the gown see yeah. on the on the on the kind of gown that you're using because there are some uh, very high gsm um, uh, materials which are you know mixture of partner polypropylene and then they are uh, further um uh, uh, treated with certain surface sur surface uh, uh, materials which they don't usually reveal uh, many of them say that you can actually uh, clean it wash it autoclave it i have actually done it for one um uh, uh, gown which was uh, priced at about 1300 they say you can do it 50 times i did it 10 times it's it's working very well at least from the 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 minimal methods that i used to try to identify it i don't know if it's gone in for scientific verification but you don't necessarily have to change many of these can be washed and reused i think maybe a couple of times although they are not officially recommended yeah. okay so uh, a just a formalin uh, encapsulation or an autoclave is a must for the gown why, why don't you just actually sure. wash it and dry it in the sun because if soap is good enough for your taking the virus off your hand i'm sure soap is good enough taking virus off uh, uh, these materials as well if you can yeah. wash them with soap so, water and probably uh, you know uh, a bleach or all, all all this all this reusing and washing of this uh, pp or the gowns so as of now it is not recommended the ideal no, thing I'm, what is recommended I'm, 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 com i'm completely aware it is not recommended yeah, uh, but so also so, is uh, walking barefoot in the clinic So you know, yes, sir. So there are several. True, sir. True. We cut corners on this, but uh, I've been practicing for the last twenty-five days, thirty days almost. I've had. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I've been using it. Uh, uh, I have no way of knowing whether I've been doing the right thing, but it seems to be a sensible thing. Under. Fine, sir. When do you? Okay. When actually? When we autoclave it? Do, do, does it change the texture of the PP? It doesn't. Sir, that's a permeability. it doesn't yeah. see i have yeah. one which i bought for 175 rupees from karur yes. it's extremely good on the fourth and fifth washes but i've got another one which we used to Is use for the right, hiv yes, it's just uh, to the hiv kit been, uh, been, that deteriorates after the first and second wash uh, there's a hiv kit one which was very popular which everybody oh, oh, uses is it so in i'm sorry actually even sir is uh, yeah. actually he is out yes. Just now he is entering back. I am joining. Sorry, oh, Ipan sir. Yeah, yeah. Sorry sir, I didn't see you. I was seeing other questions. I couldn't see you. Sorry sir. He was in the waiting room for a while. Permanent. Yeah, he was waiting. Him. I just saw him. Yeah. Oh. I added him, sir. He is uh, there, I think. I'm. I'm. I'm very sorry again. Network problem. Network issues. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm happy, sorry. Happy. Happy that I could complete the presentation at least, and all your esteemed panelists are safe. So I know all questions can be answered from you on. So anything did I miss, uh -huh. or sir? Anything? Um, yeah. so so you will get some um, some of the interesting questions to you sir how long the virus remain uh, outside the uh, human body if it is i guess outside getting exposed on the outside the human body sir because the the, sur the survival time of the virus varies as per the surface where so, in which it is getting connected 
so that is one very, very important thing because as per the material wise the on on copper surface what they say on copper that's the, one of the least uh, available time where wires can survive then comes the cardboard and think that some uh, literature says 24 hours is the time where they can survive on cardboard but then uh, some studies have also shown three days time then other surfaces you know likely in four or days basically 72 hours so 72 hours is basically the average time uh, lifespan it can survive and then recently the one okay. article was put up in our group itself where in which a study has shown the presence of virus on the surface of the mask which was untreated they when they on examination found it after six days so uh, we can the n95 the system what the all india institute of directed regarding the usage of mask once in four days four days again uh, to be on the safer side i would recommend because they have written and reported in the literature i went through that article so basically but that is actually regarding the glove the mask which has not been treated if you de if you if you decontaminate it then definitely there's no question of any uh, second risk now the mask you can just remove and with the contamination if you have kept aside in the box now this particular article is actually quest I mean, questions you whether you should keep it for one or two more days so in that case buy seven mask now buy seven mask keep it on seven okay. so seven the day take the first one simple as that uh, even can please 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 most of the studies that have been conducted on the remnant of the viral particles on surfaces have been done with a PCR, you know, and as probably all of you know, polymerase chain reaction is an extremely sensitive test which can pick up viral particles which are not necessarily infective. So you can get a positivity, but that doesn't mean it is infective. So uh, when they say uh, 20, 25 days and things like that, I'm very certain that the virus is not infective at that point of time. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's probably lying there. Uh, there are small, even a small, fraction of a bit of a, a viral particle can be reconstructed with a PCR and then it can be magnified and it can be, you know, so uh, infectivity is not necessarily uh, related to its presence on any surface. So okay. I think you need to take that. Uh, yeah, but in the current uh, scenario, Next question. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, so what about the, uh, so you go ahead, so you want to explain. No, no, I just, I just want to say what Sir said is practically and logically correct and applicable. But in the current scenario, when there is so much of uncertainties about this virus with every day coming up with new information, even a bogus news actually has to be taken with some sort of a, even if it's a, a false threat, everybody has to be a little mm -hmm. bit caught. That's why we are all on the safer side. That's all. But then uh, very rightly, like Sir said, it's unlikely to be surviving, but we can't take it as a gold standard. So uh, stick to that uh, five to seven days time, whatever time you feel a minimum required. So yeah, uh, what yeah, about uh, the... Mahindri, what, the, what, what happens to the suspended aerosols in the operatory in, after we remove the mask after the procedure? That is part one of the question. And next part is, uh, what, can we use the bathroom for doffing? No, it's definitely. See, one is about the aerosol. Now, aerosol is generated at the time. Am, am I audible? Yes, sir, very much. Now, because I'm showing your network variation. So, so aerosol is created at the time where you are using the aerotor. The aerotor or any other, that's why one of the reasons I told you as much as possible, try to use your micro motor and reduce the amount of aerosol spread. I aerosol is the, the moment you open the cavity, aerosol is created and that's going to be the air. I told you earlier, the amount of aerosol, aerosol is not going to be how you see in the net picture, the picture in the net, it's not going to be a sudden gush of air outside because that all the pictures are showing the throw of hand beast and the water together directly into the air. But in the mouth, what happens, all the area wherever you're treating, except for the anterior, so the upper and the lower, your handpiece is directed posteriorly. The, the, the throw of the air is coming from the rear end of the handpiece, and the handpiece is pushing the air with the water to the throat rather than outside the thing. So basically, the throat area is the one which is actually taking up the real velocity push of the aerosol. So once the throat area, because of the pressure variation and because of the lighter particles and because of the air content there, the aerosol passively comes out inside. So that aerosol actually do not, that's one of the reasons the aerosol do not have any active or any um, um, any, any inbuilt mechanism to fly for, uh, for distances more than uh, say two meters or six feet. But that happens because why? Because if at the time when the aerosol is generated, if your ceiling fan is on, if your air ventilation is not right, there is all possibilities that this can get carried away because of the micron size. The aerosol micron size, I told you earlier, is somewhere between 0.3 to 0.5. It can, anything beyond 0.5 or up to 8 can be considered as a higher size of aerosol. Then becomes the droplet particles. The droplet particles, I told you, is heavier that can't be carried forwards unless it is brought out by 
two mechanisms one is cough the other one is sneezing cough creates a pressure of 10 meters per second sneezing creates a pressure uh, velocity of 50 meters per second so both these are getting out your respiratory secretions that so depending upon the the reason or the way of the thing is brought out the throw of the particles also will be varying so these things you should keep in mind do not expect the aerosol what we create from a regular aerator to carry a distance what the sneeze would take it so that's something you have to be very careful about so sneeze and uh, cough is actually a mixture of a high pressure air coming from inside with the secret bronchial secretions actually that is also the bigger size the droplets that is actually what is going to get more carried so this particular suspended aerosol they were talking about suspension now by the time you finish the 30 minutes is actually the time what they say uh, time required for the aerosol to settle and uh, you know on to the flow of the remaining surfaces unless i told you the cancers which carry away by virtue of your ceiling fan as well so this suspended one actually settles in 30 minutes time so by the time you finish your procedure it will take some once not just opening you have to do the work and finish everything like that it will take another minimum 15 20 minutes time you just spare some 20 minutes you remove the mask only and spend 20 minutes that's more than enough see that much only you can take precautions and you can't just wait till another if you are that much free about then okay you can wait till say 30 minutes from the time of your procedure you can you can time it and that's not not really for practical aspects it settles down definitely you can't be 100% full proof against all this take the necessary practical precautions that's all available in the situation so it's unlikely to contact the aerosol unlikely to that and not only that aerosol unless it is actually coming to your t zone it is not going to create any harm because you're going to practice your hygiene measures also even though your mask is not being there it is not adequately sized enough because the size of aerosol is not going to come straight up into your lungs or the sort of inhalation wala area so that's a, don't have to be worried about so that so there is a question in this regard uh, if you tell the um, settling time is around 30 minutes uh, for the aerosols to come down uh, till then should we remain in the pp No, no, see, it's, that's the best way if you're worried about it. Something like, how long should I uh, keep for reusing the mask? They were asking because I told you we got a report about seven days the vi viability of the virus. So if you are storing it that way, there's no harm in waiting in that. So same way, the 30 okay. minutes is standard time. You don't have to wait. The see, 30 minutes from the time of aerosol production. So in the in the meantime, you would have taken about 15 to 20 or 25 minutes for your procedure itself. By the time you are ready to finish the procedure and make the patient wait, wait for another 10-15 minutes. Or what is there? You don't lose anything. Why not? Sir, uh, sir, why not? Uh, why don't you do the doffing immediately after doing aerosol procedures and make prescriptions or whatever discussions in another place where you do the consultation part? Uh, right. If we have a space, all those things would be fine. See. see that is again carrying the see there is the same risk what they are talking about with the moment you remove the procedure uh, after the procedure immediately when you doff it the same risk what they are talking about about suspended the thing which has actually was hanging around that area of the chair now you are taking after removing and you are taking into some other area in the consultation you going to make that area also possible uh, area of uh, you know potential source of the spread so it's better uh, to remain like what they said in the particular time take that safe time what is it? because we don't have any patients so many flocking in this particular period of time so say If practice wherever possible practically do that that's no harm in that next question okay. please okay sir what is the effectiveness of doom for aerosol procedures sir i think the doom they are mentioning about the keeping a doom over the patient's surface like a plastic box or something i think is that's the uh, answer uh, question about i'm um, sorry what's the effectiveness yeah, of doom that, for aerosol procedures sir So there are two things what they are talking about. I think whether uh, they are asking the efficacy of, of uh, so-called uh, extra oral uh, positive that uh, vacuum created while a suction. We had a dis yes. in-depth uh, discussion uh, discussion about that yesterday. Uh -huh. And now yes, that particular device it makes sense in two ways. In in first way, like you know, if uh, the aerosol <coughs> production area in and around the oral cavity, if you have uh, uh, something like now, just imagine uh, chicken. Uh, I'm sorry, not chicken. I'm thinking about eating only always. About the kitchen <laughs> chimney. What I meant is about <laughs> the kitchen chimney. What what? Oops. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please carry on. Hello. Sir, you are audible, sir. Ah, okay. You are so audible, sir. Yeah. 
Yeah, so just imagine the situation. Just imagine the situation in your kitchen. Now all the fumes, all the excess, everything goes through streamlined through the chimney. How? Because of a we have a negative pressure created which is sucking in. You think about a similar mechanism in a situation where we work. So basically, if you have a one meter square like what other person is telling, and a dome shape area which is creating a vacuum like effect on the other end through a duct, that will definitely suck the aerosol. That will prevent the aerosol getting distributed different areas. That will suck it and then, but it becomes effective. in two ways one is taking the aerosol outside from the particular area and preventing it getting getting suspended the second part of the efficiency lies in what is it going to do with the absorbed or the filtered microbes the filtered microbes if it is not killed that particular unit is going to retain this microbes and act as a reservoir for the microbes so there should be some device or a mechanism in the filter area which actually disinfect the microbes that is where the role of ultraviolet thing comes in the unit so if your unit is not designed with an efficient efficient motor to suck in the amount of aerosol and if your filter is not equipped with the device to disinfect and kill the microbes which is filtered onto the filter then the outside air coming out might be pure in terms of filtration because your filter if it is a nice filter it could actually filter the microbes because the microbe size may be uh, within the limits of the filtration range but then that is not going to kill the microbes which is stuck on the filter so basically it's always advisable to have a or design a filter with a inbuilt mechanism of disinfection at that site where the microbes are filtered so that way it's efficient and that actually will be costly we had a discussion about that such a device to uh, actually suit the requirements to give you adequate comfort of a aerosol free procedure to give you adequate safety of not providing any cross contamination it's a bit costly either uv or a fogging could be applied or any effective method not to yeah at that particular point at that particular point within the chamber uh, your uh, regular spray with alcohol or regular uv light with the disinfection which is actually going to kill the microbes on the hepa filter which is fit inside the regular filters yeah. to undo hepa only can actually give rise to that sort of a filtration of 0.3 micron similar to n95 mask because the microbes has to go inside has to get sucked because of the brownian motion has to die if it's a if it's a regular mask how would it die even though the filtration is 0.3 even though the filter your epa mask is also 0.3 the one what we use in extra high vacuum they are not built with the built in electrostatic charge to kill the microbe that's why the microbe gets stuck whereas the n95 mask even though having the same filtrate efficiency will lodge the microbe by virtue of the brownian motion and also kills the microbe by the built in uh, electrostatic charge of the melt blown second layer or the middle layer inside that is not a mechanism which is not uh, currently seen in any of those extra oral vacuum powerful uh, suck, uh, sucking uh, device so mind you unless you are sure about the disinfection of the vacuum suck uh, aerosol and the microbe don't go for investing in that so the answer for the person who was asked about the dome the dome he meant about the box around the patient's head um i ah. Oh, okay that those are all that uh, george pulser was suggesting a mechanism and a very practical uh, no, piece no, of laptop just can i just send you a picture <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah he yeah, so, uh, he send you a picture uh, so that's basically just imagine uh, a patient is kept supine on the chair and you have a, a square uh, uh, type box so just imagine uh, your regular crown cutting your crown cutting kit with a closed uh, cover on top okay and that similar like a bigger cover with the uh, orifices on both sides of the cover with two hands you can enter inside and is kept on the patient's head so the patient's head is covered with this box so that you know direct throw of the aerosol is prevented and comes and gets set in the disinfection box there and the sideways we can enter and do that now how it how practical it is and i don't know whether how uh, comfortable it is for the patient or side or no a patient who's uh, actually distressed and uh, uh, disturbed with the thought of pain coming to and sitting to you like a um, like a, i don't know how is it going whether it's a moment of pleasure or it's a moment of more nightmares i don't know and the practical aspects also i don't have any experience with that so and then this this, uh, this also has to be disinfected maybe it can be disinfected regular method so even with the disinfection there is a one surface of the box which is open the aerosols yeah, may fall under the operator's thighs and the floors and again it will go to the floor or while you are move, moving or while walking it can be transported through the legs and shifted to other places it uh, maybe it may not protect in one region out the uh, holes of the hand or holes of the assistant section everything there are possibility that aerosol might come out so it doesn't okay. have any full proofness it might be the direct projectile spread of the aerosol might be projected but it's not a complete uh, so, so, uh, prevention so in my view 
Yeah, see, in my opinion, it's basically a very well innovative idea which can be appreciated and uh, discarded for not using. Yeah. Okay, okay sir. So I think um, the that's our, those are the prime questions. So I think we have covered with the sir. How effective are the UV lamps in dental setup? Uh, there is an old question which we have uh, already discussed and so currently like uh, because I was the one who took the UV discussions and uh, yes or no, if you want to tell there is no uh, evidence that UV light gives a complete uh, protection and even in the shaded areas or the uncovered areas UV light cannot give and again penetration on the distance to which it can be covered are highly questionable in this sense and there are some concerns regarding the ozone production, skin damage and eye damage. So um, these are the concerns with that. So there is no solid evidence that this UV lights product give a good protection in the uh, dental clinic settings. So and that's course, the, uh, the answer for that. Very important. The, the, yeah. the distance matters because many things in the market now, everybody is marketing UV lights and everybody is going for it. Never, see, never ever ignore the, the, the ill effects of UV light. The best effective gem cell properties of 230 nanometers of wavelength. So all these things and then it does have this propensity of like what's only low, sense, low intensity UV light in the UVC category is actually having gem cell properties. Unfortunately, the UVC category is the one which is having most harmful effects. The lower the wavelength, the higher is the uh, harmful effects of the UV light and distance it carries because the studies, the real studies which has done in the laboratory has used uh, the distance of 22 centimeters, uh, which is actually the maximum germ cell effect. But then another has actually given me a literature yesterday where they have studied the settings in uh, ICU where the proper uh, uh, table is kept and the chairs are kept, all the settings is kept and they've kept a central uh, tower of UV tower and then they have used it for something. Uh, but again, the problem is it's, uh, it's uh, the penetration is distance and that actually shows a distance of six or eight feet carrying is there in terms of germ cell properties. But then gray areas are plenty. It's actually very well in suspended air particles where there's nothing to block your light. That's one plus distance within the thing. The studies are shown as the distance increases that the penetration depth decreases by double as per the inverse square law. There's a statement in that because that's the distance increases, the intensity reduces like anything. So what is the point in employing a light, a UV light with so much of health asset and not having a totally free area? So it can definitely use as a adjuvant to a regular floor mopping and other disinfecting methods. And of course, definitely with all the uh, inbuilt um, assets. Yes, uh, as told, it can be used as an adjuvant, but Definitely. You cannot totally rely on that. That's the take. Yes, okay, sir. Sir, um, uh, sir, there is a question. Yeah. Mandatory, sir. Uh, the voice uh, is breaking. This fogging. Uh, there is a question mandatory. like, where will we get the plastic surgical gown? I think they are asking about the uh, thin oh, plastic barriers I, 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 sharing I, I, the contact I, persons now, sir. Oh, oh, I can, I can, I can. That, that you will get that for 25 rupees uh, from uh, Droni. Uh, that's one of the manufacturers from Mumbai itself. And before that, let me make a disclaimer. I did not have any affiliation. I did not know the particular person by name, family, or any history. And that particular person happened to be one of the manufacturers. If I recommend a name or a contact number, that doesn't mean I have any personal interest in that. Let me just put that as a disclaimer first. Like I am getting yeah. the that uh, disposable gown for, None of us for this instance good. yeah yeah, so, so basically uh, 100 rupees is a gown, that full gown that uh, is basically made of SMS material. Uh, it's a non-woven fabric. That's a, that's a 50 GSM gown. And uh, the, 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 the other thing what I said is about the, the plastic sheet that I'm getting it for 25 rupees. Again, uh, disposable or you can reuse it also with the properties of it. But then don't ever think these are all things which you can be reused with the barrier properties. Now, what we discussed earlier about is now if you take proper hygiene measures and things like that, and we can actually take care of the uh, cross infection thing that's what we mentioned about wearing these things so that's about yes, this. i'll share that contact number in uh, the group regarding that sir, uh, the participant is requ requesting some words on powered air purifying respirator yeah PAPR. Uh, PAR. yeah it's a typical PAPR. Yes, basically what it does is you now that is a device that it's a very costly device it is something like a helmet okay a helmet with a visor which is fixed inside and the, from the behind part it is connected to a motor which is fixed behind on the waist so it has got a built-in device where in which it's got a filter and things like that within itself and it it actually sucks there inside purifies and circulates so basically the area what is required for the fresh air to be circulated is very less because it's only that particular area in front of the helmet 
or the so-called thing. And the volume of air is also required is very less because the volume of air what is required is only the amount what is required for the patient to breathe and to maintain the saturation level of the patient. So adequate amount of fresh oxygen can be provided in that. There's no question of air leak or anywhere else like that. It's a very good product for those who would like to have a costly thing. It's costing somewhere around 1.2 to 1.5 lakhs. So for those who want to have that at that cost, very well, go ahead, no problem. But then you can get the same effect or the same type of a safety with your N95 mask. If you want to be look like a plumber in the clinic with all sort of badges on top of it, well, go ahead with that. If you want to give your pedo, pedo children the look of an astronaut as a dentist, go ahead with that. But then with the inherent uh, disadvantage of the cost and definitely efficacy, 100%. No doubt about the efficacy. It's very good. Cost, very high. A need, not mandatory. The last Thank question you. is the fogging or fumigation mandatory? These are all covered telling me. Since the question I'll ask, you know, fogging and fumigation, whatever it is, they are all methods and well proven methods of sterilizing or disinfecting air in a very close atmosphere. It might be an operation theater, it might be a dental, in whatever it is. As of now, we don't have any authentic studies which actually gives a very reliable report upon the efficacy or need for using fogging or uh, your uh, fumigation in dental clinics. But then definitely as per the theory and for the mechanics goes, if your room is sealed properly, if the room is uh, uh, measured properly and if the amount of disinfectant or the fumigant agent, whatever you're using, is used properly, if adequate time is given for the gas to diffuse into the operatory area and if there are so, it will be definitely working and it's not a mandatory thing at all, but it's a good thing if you can have, then the, the time for uh, placing this, using this procedure and for the next patient. It's not practically possible, but I have one of my friends in the group who's using it who says they can be done in between uh, one hour or so procedure time. So, well, depending upon your patient, depending upon the time, what you can give between the patient, you can go for, if you can spare one hour or one hour in between patient, you can definitely do the fogging procedure. And there are agents currently available with the silver nitrate and hydrogen peroxide, the D125, an organic compound or the cotton yaman compound, all comes with different uh, machineries. The basic mechanism is, the agent is put in a basin and then it's just mildly heated up. The vapors come, then in the droplets are spread. That's basically fuming. If the gas is created, then it's called fumigation. The other one is uh, sort of, you know, fogging. Fogging, dry rocks, fogging. Dry fogging. So basically, both of them goes into the atmosphere, disinfects the microbes which is settled there, and then it'll make the area clean. Now, how applicable, how infective, how good it is, again, you should think about, because we are worried about the aerosol and the microbes. There's no harm in, I'm not against fumigation, but I'm telling you, it's not mandatory. I'll tell you why you not actually really need it. Because you're talking about the aerosol, you're worried about the aerosols. The aerosol is actually getting created, and it was, even if it gets suspended for an hour or so, it's it's going to settle down and that suspension time also can be reduced if you take negative measures now at that particular point if you are taking the next patient what is the point in getting the signal if you can disinfect the area of the aerosol at that particular point definitely is helpful so if you can space your appointments accordingly if you can incorporate fumigation with that material with all the uh, necessary uh, ill effects if you know about it fine no harm in going about it, but it's not at all a mandatory. It will definitely help. That's for sure, because it definitely is one of the proven methods of disinfecting the air. Uh, even sir, I think, um, th uh, thanks a lot, sir. I think we have only some 32 participants clinging on to the till 11.20 uh, or something. Uh, that's, a, that's a bombarding session uh, with your high level of energy and all the prompt and uh, having a full cover, uh, getting it under our own number. We have to put your maximum efforts to cover everything. Uh, I think that's a great effort uh, from your side and for, there is a lot of active participation from the uh, you know, uh, viewer side also. So thank you all, sir. And um, it's a great session with you and uh, thank you all members for be being with us. So uh, uh, any other co comments or anyone wants to add up something? Uh, Judge yeah. Paul, sir, you want to add Please, up something, sir? sir? I think sir is there. So, so I, I can see I can see one participant in the name of Dr. Suresh Ji is one of my favorite. He's the past IDA Kailasa secretary who knows in and out about all these things, who's been uh, one of the instrumental persons in bringing out the IDA Kailasa guidelines. Suresh, you want to comment on something? Uh, can you uh, can you unmute Dr. Suresh Ji? Dr. Suresh Yeah, Ji? yeah, I can. Uh, yes, Suresh, I will do it. Suresh, are you with us? Are you with us? I am unmuting everyone. This is not sort of safe. Hello. Don't unmute. Yes, sir, Suresh. Don't, don't, don't unmute everyone. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, I am unmuting, sir. He is, a, he is, he is, he is in line, sir.
हेलो सॉरी सर आई एम आई एम डिफरेंट सुरेश फ्रॉम कोयम्बतूर ओके हेलो हेलो सर हेलो या ओके ओके वी थॉट तमिलनाडु इज सॉरी केरला स्टेट सेक्रेटरी सुरेश वी थॉट लाइक दैट सॉरी सॉरी नो इशू सर um even sir i think um, who, who is there like you have to unmute un- unmute stephen sir uh, sorry even sir perman okay he is speaking uh, yeah hello even sir sorry sir you have been muted yes, for a uh, few minutes just now i have, muted I have, you i have, I, have, I have been talking for so long now so just now i am in oh, sorry sir so, sorry so much of talking i did <laughs> no problem no problem so next okay. session i think as per that means the discussion the next session the webinar we'll be discussing upon uh, one is about the biomedical waste and disposal uh, and uh, management will be one session another session will be now we have come and uh, finished the procedure now from here on regarding the taking of the soil and cement disinfection cleaning disinfection and disinfection sterilization protocols the methods all the practical aspects will be covered in the session to come later so i biomedical waste disposal and the cleaning decision sterilization then then uh, we can anybody has anything we can just take it up later yes uh, dr piraman and thank you all for the patient listening for so long and despite all the hurdles in between thank you for sticking with us for long i hope this session has been some interest and something beneficial for you all over to you piramal and uh, uh, definitely sir definitely it is a mind blowing session hope um, all the participants will have everything i think we should add something to the uh, extra oral section also sir like we should Please. give few informations and details about the uh, things what we shared in the admins group uh, yeah. yesterday i think yeah, because, the, we have to give few inputs to the participants regarding that also we'll, yeah, yeah we'll do that now as per the extra oral section is concerned now the we had a discussion with one of the premier uh, institutes where make this uh, you know high class uh, hepa filters uh, he had come up with the proposal in terms of making this as per the situation availability the space available in your clinic he will be you have to uh, send this specification to him and he will actually give a design of the filter on the design of the outlet thing and uh, this is actually a little complex uh, thing what we are making because one unit is actually required for one chair to be effective enough to the desired property of disinfecting and sucking out the aerosol created by that unit and uh, it has a serious process in terms of making a uv light incorporation other uh, disinfection spray incorporation a good hepa filter and then cleaning air has to be thrown back into the clinic everything is being done it's a good thing to work out but then definitely it's really costly so you can actually uh, get in touch with the senior first we'll get in that later okay okay Th- thank you sir i think thank um, you. Thank uh, you. we should end the session for uh, today i think it's very late is a longer uh, session you, uh, thank you it, it is 11 oh, 11:30 11:30 i didn't know <laughs> sir we have wasted a lot of time uh, in the session settling down the network issues and all those things ah, but it's a okay. great session sir okay thank you uh, thank you all covered try to cover you are so deeply involved sir so you you can't know the time yeah <laughs> uh, uh sometimes some point of time i was thinking whether you were taking some uh, time to take a breath in or not continuously you were just <laughs> gada 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 gada. only output is there that's a great energy from you sir thank you thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir bye bye good night sir, thank you thank you all thank good you night all. to all my participants and listeners bye bye thank you sir thanks a lot and good night thank you sir good night thank you thank you thank you thank you sir arun kumar sir okay umar ji gopal sir thank you permal solung sir thank you permal so no, no, thanks a lot sir thank you thank you thanks a lot sorry sir i couldn't uh, log in the initial time uh, the network is issue is also very bad over here so i am trying with the multiple networks and finally nothing could work over here
இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் இது இந்த வெபினார்ல எல்லாம் இல்லையா ஆமா சார் இட்ஸ் a very thing because uh, uh, yesterday i was logging in some 20 minutes before um uh, dr uh, george was there and uh, we were discussing and the right at 5 minutes before the moment it got uh, slashed so start tough again yesterday but postponed in the last last minute yes sir yes sir okay okay permal good night yeah good night sir thank you sir thank you i am ending the meetings